Today I have a very special guest. His name is John Verveke and he's an award-winning lecturer at the University of Toronto. In the new series I'm also interested in trying to get all the platonic stuff and the neoplatonic stuff and, and, and make use of that to try and reconfigure a worldview in which the cultivation of wisdom and self-transcendence and virtue uh, makes both intellectual and existential sense to us. He has an amazing series on YouTube called Buddhism and Cognitive Science. He co-authored a book titled Zombies in Western Culture. And so the zombie, you know, the way they move in hordes, the shuffling hordes, without there being any shared communication or culture. It's, it's the dark nightmare side of how we sometimes feel like we're shuffling through the streets with all of these strangers around us. And he has a new series being released now on Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. I don't want to build my audience on the back of controversy. Politicizing these issues, thinking that they're issues of the conflict of political ideologies, is something I want to deeply undermine, because that is precisely one of the things driving the meaning crisis. John is doing some amazing work. I felt very lucky to speak with him, and I hope you guys enjoy. I thought we could start by discussing some of your background and education and how that has led you to this topic of meaning, which is so central to your work. Sure, sure. Um, so I, I started out, uh, I was doing a, a BA in Hamilton at McMaster, and I just, I took a philosophy course and I got very interested. Um, I read uh, The Republic by Plato, I got very interested in the topic of wisdom and this quest for meaning in life. And by that time in my own personal life, <clears throat> I was post-religious. I'd been brought up um, in sort of a, uh, a very sort of fundamentalist Christian uh, uh, upbringing. And I was sort of post that and I was <clears throat> looking around. And initially I got very uh, interested in what was going on. But as I went on in academic philosophy, although I saw its value and I went on to get PhD and everything um, and how it helps us better understand science and culture, the, the whole Platonic Aristotelian quest uh, for wisdom and uh, meaning in life and self-transcendence was not being discussed very adequately in academic philosophy. So uh -huh. I started I started to do stuff extracurricular, which I've continued to this day. I did I learned Tai Chi Chuan, I learned uh, uh, Vipassana meditation, meta contemplation, a bunch of other practices, pranayama, yoga. I do all that. I teach some of it extracurricular. And then, and then I felt this big disjunct between I'm doing all these sort of wisdom cultivation practices over here, and I have all this academic stuff. So mm -hmm. then I decided to find, how can I put them together? So I went back and I, I, I did a BSc in cognitive science to get the scientific training. And then I went on and did more of that, and then I went into cognitive science. And by that time, it's just one of those weird synchronicities, the field had started to catch up. Field in, people in cognitive science and cognitive psychology, those are my two areas of specialty. Do a, do a lot of work on wisdom, meaning, all this stuff. So a lot of your work has been connecting the, the practical stuff you do in martial arts and yeah. all, the, all the education you've had. Yeah. Um, so I know, I think I heard in one of your classes that you, you said you went to school for 17 years. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? Well, I, I went to, well, I went to university, yeah, for, I went to university for 17 years because you need to get very good um, expertise in one of the core disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I basically I had done like I, I did had got up to my MA in philosophy. So I, I had got quite a bit of expertise in that, and that's when I, as I mentioned, I realized I really wanted to do cognitive science. So that I went back into the cognitive science, and then I went back and did my PhD. And so adding in that whole other undergraduate degree, uh, and then a, a longer PhD because I was integrating stuff together, that really added a, added quite a bit onto it. So philosophy, that was kind of your first interest, right? That was my first interest, yeah. Okay, okay. Because right when I started reading um, Plato and Aristotle and all these philosophers, is right when I came across your videos, and you had some of the best explanations. Because, you know, that's not the easiest thing to jump right into, oh. is Plato. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I mean, I, I, I've been privileged to teach at U of T uh, for, I guess, what is it, 25 years now? Mm -hmm. And so had a lot and you know and these are really bright people I'm uh, getting to work with so I've got I, I, I that has afforded me an arena in which I can really practice refining explaining these ideas um, and so I really appreciate that opportunity because I think these ideas are are uh, really pertinent and relevant to many people today um, and making them accessible and making them 
sort of vibrant again for people is one of the things that I consider my important one of my important goals. Mm -hmm. So it, a lot of the course it builds up to to Buddhism, and you talk a lot about practice practices of mindfulness and yeah. how people can integrate that in their lives. And there was something really interesting you said about mindfulness that there's something we get wrong in the West. And that is how we interpret the Buddhist notion of suffering. And that was a really interesting point. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, part of the argument uh, um, is um, that we've typically understood suffering as the experience of pain. Um, and although there are metaphors in the Buddhist scriptures where pain is used uh, to talk about the suffering, uh, that's not the most common metaphor. The two most common metaphors are imprisonment, trapped, fettered, locked, stuck, and diseased, right? And and so I thought, oh, well, what's being emphasized there? And this is our, actually the original meaning of our word, suffer, like, uh, which is a loss of agency. You're giving up, you're losing your agency. So you can actually technically suffer joy I mean, mm -hmm. that's not a misuse of the word. It's, it's an archaic use of the word. People go, what do you mean? But what it literally means is I've o I'm overwhelmed by joy and I sort of lose my yeah. agency. Losing so control. Much. Yeah. And so this idea of losing agency is much more important because it's much more directly relevant to uh, what the Buddha claimed. He said, you know, you, just like you can, it, no matter where you taste the ocean, it tastes of salt. No matter where you dip into my teaching, it's all about freedom, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the freedom from this loss of agency uh, I think is uh, one of the major things. I think this is part and parcel of the, I mean, Leo Ferrar and I, I published an article a couple years ago uh, on this about the West has really got a sort of very narrow and I think overly superficial understanding uh, of mindfulness and has misinterpreted it in some pretty fundamental ways. Mm -hmm. I, I talk about this also in the news series, uh, talk about the mindfulness re revolution, and I try and give it a, a stronger account of what I, how I think we should understand and interpret mindfulness yeah yeah okay in the new series the new series is great by the way i've seen the first okay. two episodes so far thank yeah. you yeah it really does a great job on building from uh the last series uh, yeah that was, that was exactly the hope yeah yeah uh, that was the hope was to so that people are who have people uh, i was trying to split the difference i was trying to get it so that people who have seen the series will say oh well, I, I get this this is familiar i can build on it but also yeah. people coming in from nowhere can watch the new series and, 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 it, and it, it's a standalone. So like, yeah. that, that, that's, that's been a tricky balance, but yeah. so far, I, I think we're getting it right. I, I'm working with some really great people, uh, you know, who are really helping uh, with the direction and the editing and the filming and everything. Um, yeah, and, yeah, well, it wasn't just the content, all the, the editing, the, the filming, was everything was great. Yeah, well, I really wanted to, I mean, it's common complaints I got in the, Buddhism and Cog Sai series is like the audio and the video. Because all I did was just set up a camera and put yeah. on a mic, right? Because yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think that much of it. But one of the yeah. most common criticisms is like, well, you know, the content is great, but the format is crap. Yeah. Uh, so I really wanted to improve it this time. Yeah, well, that's what everyone on YouTube does is like when I first started, the audio was off, like the, the yeah. video wasn't that great. And you just kind of learn as you go, yeah. you know, it gets better and better. Um, but so you said you, you had a religious upbringing. Yeah, it was, it was a Christian. And so okay. um, I, I keep an eye on that because I try, I, I try to be, um, how can I put this? I try to be very respectful of whenever I'm talking about a religious framework. And, and I try to be especially mindful of Christianity because, of course, I, I'm going to have a, a, a sort of biased take on it. And so I yeah. keep, I, I repeatedly ask uh, any practicing Christians in my class if, like if they're if they're being offended uh, by what I'm doing, and I, I consistently get no. They say no, it's good. Uh, you know, sometimes it's mm -hmm. challenging, but I still find it beneficial. And you're yeah. very respectful, and so that's very important to me as well. That's good, and it's it's, it's important, I think, to have your beliefs challenged like that, and to be okay with it, and to get yeah. used to get used to people doing that. Because I think that's that's kind of what university is supposed to do, right? I, I think so. I mean, I, that's what I would hope so. It, it's yeah. it, you know. Um, it depends uh, what course you're in, but it, it, certainly in the courses I'm privileged to teach, people are coming in with an expectation, uh, both from the content of the course and something of my reputation, that these courses are going to challenge them in sort of fundamental ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Right. So, yeah, I, I grew up in a, a very strict Christian household. Right. And um, I remember when the Harry Potter series came out, like I had to hide them from my dad because oh. it was all about like witchcraft and yeah. all this evil yeah. stuff, right? 
And so I was very biased against any part of the Christian worldview for most of my life. Sure. Um, until recently, I've kind of I've kind of found the beauty in Christian symbolism. Recently. Right. Um, I don't think I could ever go back to it just because of that experience I had. Yeah. yeah I but like, yeah, say if someone asked me what I'm reading and I say the Tao Te Ching, they'll be like, oh, OK, OK, interesting. But if I said the Bible, they're like, oh, and they yeah. kind of they kind of have the, all these preconceived notions about it, which, that, um, yeah, yeah, I think is like too personal for a lot of people in the West, it, which you make the bridge to Buddhism. Um, and you say that's a way to bridge that gap. Well, that's one of the things I recommend. Uh, I mean, I. I, I'm also, I mean, I, I, I'm privileged to be in dialogue with uh, uh, some Christians that I really deeply respect, uh, Jonathan Pajot, Paul, Paul Vanderclay, right? Um, and, and, and they bring, you know, philosophical profundity. And, um, and, and so um, I, I understand what they're doing, but um, I think that they also appreciate what I'm saying, that for many people like yourself and I, that really isn't an option. And that seems to be something that's growing culturally in the West. I, I, I mean, the numbers are pretty clear about that. Um, and so we need something other, uh, another sort of set of psychotechnologies and practices and institutions and traditions. Um, I've also, uh, I mean, uh, in, in that series, because that was the sort of the syllabus content of the course, it focuses in on Buddhism quite a bit, uh, because that's one of the things that people are reaching to, to try and bridge between the practice and the science. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I, of course, do that in the new series, but in the new series, I'm also interested in trying to get some of the uh, pre-Christian sort of heritage from the West, all, all the Platonic stuff and the Neoplatonic stuff, and can we access that um, and, and, and make use of that to try and reconfigure a worldview in which the cultivation of wisdom and self-transcendence and virtue uh, makes both intellectual and existential sense to us. Yeah, that's what I like about the series is you're 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 showing how it all all works together. Trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's what you show with with each philosopher you talk about. When you talk about Augustine, you show how he merged all the worldviews of yeah. Israel and Greece and Plotinus and Plato and all these people. Yeah, I mean, and, and because you got to explain why did this stuff take off and why does he become this like literally civilization building individual? You know, medieval civilization sort of built on Augustine in profound ways, and so. Um, you don't want to trivialize that. You want to take one. You, 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 I mean, it's really important to, to try and really, really deeply get into like the the worldview that the people had and what was functioning for them. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I really try to re, I, I re, re, reverse engineer the viability. What made this viable for people? And, and I mean, these are these are intelligent, thoughtful, rational, reflective, spiritually deep people. What made this viable for them? I really want. I, I try to work really hard to reverse engineer that. How could I, what would I need to be doing? What would I need to be practicing? How would my worldview have to be functioning in order that I, this could be viable for me? And then that's what I try to articulate. I feel like nowadays we think, oh, they were just superstitious. So it didn't really matter what they believed. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. kind of a way of dismissing the, the whole reason why it was, it was such, a, such a powerful idea. Exactly. And, and, then, and the, the problem with that, uh, with that dismissal, <laughs> Is it you know we we tend to we're, we're building all these blinders that prevent us from looking for things that might be structurally or functionally analogous right now, right? Um, and and the thing is, I'm not I make it clear in both series, like I'm not saying we go back to these things. This is not a nostalgic thing, but it's like if we understand them properly, that will give us when you reverse engineer, you get the capacity for renewing your engineering, like to, yeah. to try and make something now. My pro I, pre I see my project, and I, I hope people don't misunderstand when I use this term. I mean it respectfully. I'm trying to salvage everything I can yeah. from the to get. You're not the, trying to, to convert get, anyone. No, 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 no. I, I want to salvage as much as I can from all of this vast heritage, and so that we can appropriate this legacy and and, and retool ourselves for confronting the meaning crisis right now. And you also talk about a lot about um, in the new series shamanism and yep. altered states and yep. um, that back yeah. in. Do you receive any pushback talking about that in an academic setting? Um, a little, um, yeah. So there's uh, when we get into like the actually yeah the third and fourth uh, video fifth. There's even more because that's a lot of work I've been doing. Depends. So in one sense, very strong academic support. I was invited by Lori Paul, who I constantly recommend in both series. Uh, down to Yale to talk to her class on all this stuff, uh -huh. uh, Alex. 
So they're like, wow, that's a, you know, that's like, oh, that's pretty official academic appreciation, right? Yeah. But, but also, but, but I've also had within at UFT to have people saying, well, well, like, oh, what are you doing? And I was saying, well, like, this is really important research. This is why, and there's lots of people working on it. So they can't deny that it's scientifically valid. But yeah, there's still this like, mm, yeah. I, I get, I get that response from some people. And then it's like, you know what, people, and, and I, I, so my official position, just to restate it. Right. Um, and if anybody's watching, they can right. you know, government people like I'm against prohibition on any of uh, any substance because it doesn't work. The data on this is really clear. Like we're going to pay attention. To prohibition doesn't work. It doesn't affect addiction rates. Right. And, yeah. and the, chem the chemical dependence model of addiction is more abundant. It's obsolete. That's not how addiction works. So yeah. justification is is obsolete. And the data shows it, it's ineffective. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I'm against the recreational use of my of consciousness, mind altering drugs, because yeah. right, this is part of the whole way in which people can enhance self deception and the cultural project of like really trivializing and dismissing the spiritual and transformative potential of experiences. Well, one of the things you talk about is we had, we used to have universities, yeah. which is where we get knowledge. And then we had other places where we'd get wisdom. The monastery. Yeah, but now there's nowhere that we get wisdom anymore. That's right. I love to do that in the class. I'll say, well, where do you go for for information? Well, the internet. Where do you go for knowledge? You know, the university, science. And then where do you go for wisdom? And then there's a then there then there's this stony silence. It's like, and then I, I when I say, well, you know, foolishness is something much more than just ignorance, right? You know, ignorance is just a lack of knowledge, whereas foolishness is, you know, you're caught up. In you know a, a compelling pattern of self-deception and self-destruction, and that requires a lot of intervention. We know this because th th this is why we have therapists, which, right? Yeah. We, we have, it's unfortunate that we have uh, sort of lost. I don't know what to call it—the cultural commitment to making this uh, a central issue that we uh, aid people in in their lives. Like we just, as a culture, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and and we're paying for it, right? We yeah, you know, we have a mental health crisis. We have all kinds of you know deaths of despair on the rise. We we have people. We have increasing um, uh, sense of nihilism and cynicism in our culture, um, and it's, you know it's it's eroding our political institutions at a very rapid rate. All this kind of stuff. We're paying for it very deeply. Um, so, um, about two or three, no, about four years before I did the Buddhism and Cog Sai series. So that's what, 2016. So maybe around 2012 or so. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I was already crafting that argument, building it in, because I'd already been teaching that course for a while, like building that argument. 
And then I realized, and it was like, it was like, oh, it was kind of a union insight. It's like, well, but there should be a there should be a mythological expression of an emerging crisis. Yeah. Right? And then it was oh crap, and that's when the zombies were taking off, right? Um, yeah, and so yeah. that's just how it came together. Um, Jonathan Pajot independently came to that uh, realization. Oh, uh, he did. Okay. Yeah. I, I had seen you guys talk, and that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's how we actually met. He independently came to it, um, and then he was giving a talk, and he mentioned um, he, he did he did a quite extension, not just a mention. He did a quite an extension extensive exposition on the shout out i'm john ravaki what do you think and he said oh man we got to talk and so yeah that's how we ended up doing the talk on his uh, on his channel cool yeah that's interesting that that you came to those two conclusions uh simultaneously yeah and i know he, he talks about how um the zombie is a perversion of the the death and resurrection yeah myth, um we, and christianity and um yeah that's that's probably how how he got to that and and yeah. you make the case in in the stuff you talk about how Christianity was the was the scaffolding that basically held up our society for so long, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. the the zombie when it when it um, perverts that that story, it's like all that history is just being wiped out. Yeah, I think that's yeah. So my co-authors and I, you know, Christopher Master Pietro and Philip Misovic, we we were talking. That's why we would were, we were arguing, right? That um, it's not just the zombie; it's the zombie apocalypse. It's the combination. It's not only a perversion of, of the, the resurrection, right, which, uh, yeah, Jonathan also talks about. Uh, we talk about how the apocalypse is a perversion of the Christian notion of apocalypse, which mm -hmm. is the, the, the culmination, the redemption of all of history that gives history all of its meaning. And, of course, the whole point about apocalypse in the zombie mythology is it doesn't redeem the world. or It actually it just it opens into this sort of vapid nothingness, uh, right, going forward. Yeah. And, and 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 the, and the sense that the world is ending, but not in any any way that's affording redemption or restructuring or, or changing, and and so yeah, I what we were trying to get on uh, about is that that the, the like the collapse of this framework, the the what uh, Berger calls like the the sacred canopy, is is way more comprehensive uh, because uh, because it it goes to the, the metaphor I, I often use is. Like we, we have this sort of conceptual grammar by which we sort of think and make sense. And that that was so interwoven with two things, sort of the Christian framework and, and the Platonic framework. And as those have eroded, right? Uh, yes, many people up here, they're all, oh, I'm happy. With you. I don't believe like you and I, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is when that grammar got, gets eroded, we, we have to replace the grammar, even though We've already dispensed with the beliefs. This is part of why, again, I, I often repeat this: people don't get it when Nietzsche is saying that God is dead. Right? That's yeah. why. That's that's why the madman says it to atheists. He's not saying it to believers. He goes into the marketplace and he says it to atheists because he says, "You don't know what you've done. Like you've taken a sponge and you've erased the sky, and now we're forever falling. Like you, you like you. We have to replace what this was doing for us. We can't just stop believing at the superficial level." So um, watching your, your first series, Buddhism and Cognitive Science, it felt like it was kind of building up to Nietzsche. Yeah. And I, I, was, I was very excited when you said that a lot of um, your new series would talk about Nietzsche and Jung and how they were going to integrate into yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've already got, a, I mean, we, 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 we sort of, we, in the can we have sort of 23 videos. Um, and I've already done a bit of Nietzsche in one of them, sort of laying him into the history. And then when I come back at the end and talk about the meaning crisis per se, I'm going to do a bigger, a bigger chunk on him, so that he's going to show up in sort of two places in the new series in a more substantial way. Uh, and part of it again is I want to do more on like what was going on and what what's the central. I think for me, what Nietzsche's trying to do, right, the central project is he's trying to recover self transcendence within a a world in which. Um, the two worlds mythology, the axial revolution mythology ha has decayed for us and he's struggling to do it. But I think he's still caught up in a lot of the Christian grammar uh, mm -hmm. and, and he doesn't quite, uh, he basically works the Christian grammar, which is not to escape from it. It's still to be working within it. Um, right. And so, and I don't mean this, in a, I don't mean this to be dismissive of Nietzsche about what we need is sort of a post-Nietzschean response now. Nietzsche was a great articulator, I think, of the problem. And he even, even so insofar as indicating some of the things that are going to be needed for a solution. But I don't think his solution is the answer kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
we talk about the collapse of religious belief and it seems like we kind of we project that belief out onto other things that aren't a religion and that's that's worked out disastrously right yes so i mean i, I talk a, a, quite a bit more about this in the new series right because uh, i take the history farther than i did in the buddhism and talk psych course i talk about uh, uh post-romantic pseudo-religious ideologies like nazism and marxism um and, and, and nationalism patriotism all these surrogates um and even um even stuff we're doing now which is you know people who are I'm not religious, and yet they're, they're, they're like they're obsessed with superhero movies, and yeah. they want they want they try as much as they can to symbolically live in that world and, and identify with individuals. And um, so, yeah, there's a, a lot of the attempts, and, and uh, many of them are, are nostalgic uh, in, in in a critical sense of that term uh, attempts to yeah, try yeah. And, and replace that grammar, uh, but. <sighs> They fail for some very deep reasons. One of the uh, one of the reasons is many of them are are caught within a model like a, a framing of the scientific understanding of the mind that we've largely inherited from Descartes, and that's that's now the project of philosophy and cognitive science in the last hundred years has been trying to deconstruct that Cartesian framework and open us up uh, to alternatives. <clears throat> like one of them is even to think about. We even use this as a synonym to think about religion as a system, as belief, as a system of beliefs. That belief is the primary thing we should be like focusing on, and and yeah. so we keep trying to create ideological responses to the meaning crisis without realizing that it, it it pervades into much deeper levels of the psyche than are reached by just our our, our sort of introspectable beliefs. You talk a lot about meaning in life and how yeah. we, that's all been lost to us uh, in our in our modern world based on your work and maybe in like the attitude you see in your students are you optimistic about regaining that meaning yeah i mean so uh, well on most days <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. but um, i mean so i again one of the things that's hopeful is meaning in life is such a hot topic now in many aspects of cognitive science it's a hot topic in philosophy very hot topic in psychology doing work on it my lab the consciousness and wisdom study labs we just did a huge m turk study and we we found that there's a significant like a, a, no, not just statistically significant but a significant correlation between um, if people have mystical experience and how meaningful they rate their life and then and then trying to find out okay what is it in the experience is sort of doing most of the heavy lifting. And, and this lines up with other work by someone, Samantha Heinzelman and others, that it's sort of the insight-like machinery of recognition is sort of this making coherence, making sense, right? Um, that's the level um, at which you can improve people's meaning in life. And it, it, it's, it's, it's being able to, again, trigger these kinds of experiences with reliable systems of uh, psychotechnologies that are set within an intellectually and culturally validated, right, um, worldview and framework that I think is doable for us now. Because I, I think uh, I think all the pieces, there's so many good people doing work on all of the pieces, and we're, we're making pretty significant understanding in all the components. And there is great, and on the other side, right, there's great cultural hunger for all of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I see this confluence picking up speed. Now I'm not, I'm not I, I don't I think there's I don't, I don't believe in destiny or anything like that. And this can all go wrong in many ways because we're in a we're in a very tight race, right? Because trying to get this addressed is is meshed up with other horrible things we're facing in our culture. Like there's political, socioeconomic, environmental issues that are pressing on us in a very urgent manner. We, you talk about the the shaman too, and it seems like just in the last maybe five to seven years, there's been a rediscovering of the shaman and trying to get back to wisdom, um, as you talk about. So uh, again, I think that's there, there, there's again uh, there's good and bad about that. The fact that the attempt, that the attempt, right? So there, this is like this is a mythological attempt to try and get back before this history, so that we can. And I think there's sort of. A, like I don't want to call it an unconscious, but this sort of semi-conscious understanding that we got to somehow get back uh, to um, this machinery that's been layered over, and, and I respect that. And then the idea that 
you know, altered states of consciousness uh, and transformative experiences play an integral role in uh, self-transcendence and self-transcendence itself plays an integral role in the cultivation of wisdom. You really can't overcome pervasive self-deception unless you're doing powerful self-transcendence. Those mm -hmm. two are just locked like this together, right? I think that all is very good. The, the problem we have Man, this is, uh, I, I think you noted this in the, in, the, in the old series and it's in the new series as well, is our culture tends to commodify and trivialize things and displace them from an ecology of practices. Like, again, uh, too many people are just sort of taking shamanism and then all just practice it on my own as somebody in North America in the year 2019. And that has no problem. It's from something that, you know, is from the upper Paleolithic era, right? Yeah. And the others, like, come on, that, that you, you have to pay attention to like yeah. what, like that. So yeah. Well, yeah, there's like this hubris in thinking you can do something on your own that has this thousands of years of history yeah. behind it. And you're like, ah, I'm good. I can just, I can do it on my own. Exactly. And, it, and, and so this is part of the problem we face, right? Uh, there's a bit of, uh, you know, a, a cult of individualism that we've inherited in the West uh, of, you know, uh, and this again, this is part of the Christian heritage. The Christian heritage tended to give us the sense of the value of the individual because of its mythology of the individual soul that was destined to return to God. And, 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 I, I, and that has had a lot of positive benefits for us. But we have tended to come to this idea of the completely self-reliant, self-made individual which is a mythology, right? There are just so many ways in which that's not true of us. In fact, one of the exciting things that's going on in cognitive science right now is to understand how much brains work uh, in, in networks, in what's called distributed cognition. Most of our problem solving is done long before the internet networked computers together, culture was networking brains together, because most of our significant problem solving is done by networking brains yeah. together. And, and like, look at the language you're using. You didn't make it, I didn't make it. Right, uh, this technology, I didn't make it, you didn't make it, right? Yeah. This is what I mean. It's already there. Yeah, and so you, you can't sort of leap out of all of that into uh, sort of raw and rugged individualism. Um, now, everybody, I'm, please, that's different from the moral argument that we all have to bear individual responsibility for our actions. I'm not denying that. I'm making a point, I'm making a, di and, and part of the, my point is we shouldn't confuse the fact that we are individually morally responsible with the fact that our cognition often works in a distributed fashion. So do you think it's um, taking individual responsibility, but doing that within a culture and within a community? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's very well put, that's very well put. Yeah, and one of the big things you talk about in the, the, the book on zombies is that we're surrounded by each other, but completely yeah. isolated at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and which is, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, and the zombie just captures that um, and reflect. I mean, myth, but the point about myth, right, is, is to reflect back. I mean, it's to transform it and, and, and through imagery and reflect it back to us so that we can gain some awareness and insight, right? And so the zombie, you know, the way they move in hordes, the shuffling hordes, without there being any shared communication or culture, it, it, it's, it's, it's the dark nightmare side of, how we, how we sometimes feel like we're shuffling through the streets with all of these strangers around us. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I think it's interesting you use the word reflection and myth as a reflection of, um, of these patterns that we're playing out. And a lot of people take myth as just, oh, a, a, a fairy tale, you know, something that's not true that a yeah. lot of people believe. So that's an unfortunate uh, negative consequence of the Enlightenment. I, I don't mean Buddhist Enlightenment, I mean the period in the in, in Western history called the Enlightenment, you know, the 16th, the 16th and 17th centuries, right? Um, early 18th century even, um, in which, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the scientific revolution, uh, there's the development of a, of, 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 of a completely secular state, um, there's the industrial revolution, all these things are coordinating together. Um, and so, and there was a project of trying to understand everything before that as you know, superstitious or inaccurate or incomplete or, or something like that. And, and I think that has led us to misunderstand myth. And, and the problem is the myth understanding is on sort of both sides of the debate. People who see them, like, so the, 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 the point about, like I say, the point about myth isn't to give us literal stories about some 
past. Something right? that actually happened. Yeah. But, um, and, and so I think fundamentalism is, is very much the same mindset uh, applied to the myths as the people who reject myths because, mm -hmm. right? Um, no, so the point about myth and the reason why the myths persist, and not all myths persist, they die. Yeah. Right? And, and that tells you that they, they aren't being judged in terms of their literal truth or falsity. They're being judged in terms of how they resonate with us, how they perform this reflective function of putting us in contact with sort of perennial problems that are very hard to keep in mind, very hard yeah. to reflect. I mean, think about the fact that many of the things that you really, I, I do this in the lecture, so you're familiar with this, many of the things that we very value, it's very hard to hold in mind, like holding justice in mind is very hard. We need a symbol, we need a myth, and, and, and then if you can tell a story around the symbol, it becomes more efficacious, and if there's a story, you can put yourself into sort of a participation, you can get involved, and so what myths do is they help us, right, they're about these perennial problems, these perennial patterns, and, and they give us ways of holding these otherwise difficult things in mind and involving ourselves with them. That's very, very powerful. That's why yeah. people want to be zombies. That's why they, they go on these zombie walks. And you're yeah. like, why are you doing this? Like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of religions, they you focus on um, ethics and being a good person. And you say, like, why do I need a story to tell me how to be a good person? But it's like you say, it's hard to hold that in your mind all the time. Yeah. That's it's right. like I know what takes it what it takes to be a good person, but when you go in your life and you're faced with problems, right? You you act on instinct and you don't you don't you don't think about that. That's right. This this is it, this is people who say this are uh, the point you just made is uh, you know well, what do I need a story for? It was because, because I mean your 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 autobiographical memory abilities are something that you don't aren't natural to you. You like look we practice narrative. All the time, like yeah. like everywhere, where every we get up and we read stories and we look stories and when you meet somebody, you tell them your story. And if I ask you who you are as a person, not as a biological organism, but who you are as a person, you tell me your autobiography. And when you're watching the news and you don't know the story, oh, why did that happen? You get all upset. But when a story is given to you, you relax because stories are how we actually create that autobiographical sense of ourselves extended in time, you know, into the past and future. I'm gonna talk more about this in the new series. And so like, no, stories are, again, they're, they're part of the grammar of your agency as a person, as a moral agent, right? Yeah. And, and so that's why stories matter. Yeah, and um, one thing I love about your work is it's, it's very grounded in science. Like you talk a lot about the science of the mind, um, but it's also, it's very focused on the human experience and yeah. You yeah. focus on that aspect. Is that something you um, you make a, a point to focus on? And I think that's why your your talks are so captivating. Thank you. Uh, thank you for saying that uh, because that's exactly right. Uh, for me, bridging between those is a, an explicit and constant goal that I use to guide me uh, when I'm trying to do my work. Really trying to get right uh, the science and the experience. Um, really, really well wedded together so that they're mutually informing each other. Um, th yeah, that's that, 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 that's like the North Star of my work. I'm constantly orienting towards that. And one thing you talk about is um, a very pivotal moment in uh, our history, which is Descartes. Right. And you talk about one of his contemporaries, Spinoza, and how different our world could have been yeah, um, yeah. If, if, if we had followed the, the principles of Spinoza instead of Descartes. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, how, how different it could have been. Okay, yeah, sure. I mean, so that's great. This gives me a chance to advertise for Spinoza. Spinoza is going through something of a renaissance now, um, at least within academic philosophy. There's a growing appreciation of his relevance, like how relevant he is now to us. Mm -hmm. So the thing, that was just a very, very quick thing, of, so who is he, right? And yeah. so the thing about uh, Spinoza is he's a contemporary of Descartes. Uh, so he, 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 he is a big fan of and is like enmeshed with the new emerging science. And the, so one of the things that happens with Descartes is we get mathematics wedded to science. Aristotelian science has no math in it. And so you get math as the core of science and mathematical reasoning. And, and so Spinoza is, he, he is uh, like Descartes a genius. But Spinoza is too. He, his ability to like 
mathematically, logically reason is surpassed. When you read his book, The Ethics, but remember that title, when you read his book, The Ethics, it is like reading Euclid's geometry. It is, you know, axiom proof. I'm not saying it's absolutely flawless, but man, talk about something that is logically, logically rigorous, right? So you've got all of what was being valued in the Cartesian revolution, but, and this is the important point, it's called the ethics because it's about not just the, the, the new scientific worldview, it's about how can I recover, right, a sense of sacredness, blessedness, self-transcendence, wisdom. These are all terms Spinoza is really key to talk about within and completely consistent with that scientific method. So for me, Spinoza is like, he had, like that's part of the North Star I was talking about. He yeah. was trying really wed them together. And when you read the ethics, it's not just the content. The way it's, the way it's designed, it, it's really transformative on your cognition. It's like going through, like, like a, almost like I'm, I don't mean in terms of content, but in the effect it has on you. It's like going through a meditation course. It's, it's not just changing what you believe, it's changing how you think and how you see, right? And so if we, if he, if that had been more central, right, then the project of keeping the two together would have been more central for us. And yeah. that, that would probably have led to a very different place than where we are now. Yeah, because Descartes kind of does away with all that stuff. He said the only thing that's real is this small slice of consciousness that yeah. I can prove 100 percent exists yeah yeah and it's, it's with the and also with descartes right the i, I mean he, he he does like in the passions and stuff he is he is interested um with trying to help people sort of develop um and and, and i think his whole project is a response to uh the uh the emergence of the meaning crisis with the emergence of the scientific revolution but i think he fundamentally misunderstood it so I mean I, I don't I'm not, I don't like it when people blame Descartes for everything, but uh, uh, I'm not saying you said that either. Um, I think Descartes gets the the existential anxiety and dread and, and, and that's going on. I mean his one of his contemporaries Pascal says you know the infinite spaces terrify me. Right? Mm -hmm. Descartes gets that, but Descartes thinks the the way to alleviate anxiety is by pursuing certainty, and he thinks that what the new math and what science is going to give us is certainty. And, and what we've discovered through the history of science, right, and the philosophy of science is, no, science doesn't give you certainty. In fact, that's what, what's valuable about science isn't the, the content being certain, because it never is. It's that the process is so fantastically and elegantly self-correcting. Mm -hmm. That's what matters, right? And so, and I think Spinoza sees that way better than Descartes, right? Mm -hmm. Way, way better. Okay, and so I know you talk a lot about practices. We we need the we need the knowledge, but we also need the practices in our lives. And you're you're a martial artist, right? Yeah. 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 What kind of martial arts do you do? Like I do Tai Chi Chuan. That's the primary one. I do uh, different versions of it. There's a slow form I do. I also do a fast striking form called Pajin. I do a sword form as well. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um. So I've done jujitsu for a long time. Sure. And, that's and, yeah. And, and, uh, 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 just, just, just as a side, this is anecdotal. I haven't done any scientific uh, investigation on it, so take it with a big grain of salt, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Sorry, a, a lot of people who come to my work I, often have kind of a martial art, yeah, it, right. So I think that gives them a way of understanding some of the stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, a lot of the stuff you talk about in like states of flow, like you definitely yeah. experience that. Yeah. Um, and so there's this um, instructor. His name's John Danaher. And he had a really interesting way of describing why jujitsu and martial arts are so addicting. It's such an addicting practice. And he says that we are, are complex, unique problem solvers. But in jujitsu, we're not being presented with a static problem. We're being presented with another complex and unique problem solver. So I give this person a problem, they solve it, they give a problem back to me, and it just goes back and forth like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that, I thought that was a really interesting uh, a point that he made. I think that's an excellent point. That's why the, the that's why other people are the best flow inducers for us. In fact, yeah, uh, if you want to get into the flow state. The best thing, the best video games are coming close, right? Uh, but the best thing is is like some kind of cooperative, competitive thing with another human being. Yeah. Um. So you also talk about mindfulness practices a lot, and that's maybe I misunderstood this, but you, you I think, I believe you're saying that by practicing mindfulness, you can make that flow state uh, m more of your default state. You get closer and closer to making oh, that your yeah. default. To to totally, totally. I mean, that's, I mean th that was a claim made way back when in 1990 when Chick Sant Mahai did the book on flow. He argued yeah. that 
uh, he talks about the sort of environmental conditions that are conducive to flow, but he says, what are the sort of, what's the skill set of the person uh, and that is more likely to get into flow? And mindfulness training um, is one of the best predictors of your ability to get into the flow state. Uh, and we actually talk about that, um, uh, Leo and uh, uh, Arian, uh, uh, Leo Ferraro area, Hera Bennett, and uh, we published uh, an article last year in the Oxford Handbook of Spontaneous Thought on flow. And we try to argue about the deep connect, like arguing the explained sense, the deep connections between mindfulness, insight, flow. And they all have to do with sort of uh, how you're learning to discipline your attention so that you can restructure what you find relevant and salient. But you have to learn how to do this often, as you're saying, in this really complex, mm -hmm. uh, sophisticated manner when the environment you're doing dealing with is also complex. Yeah, environment's constantly changing. Exactly. Um, and when you talk about flow, you also uh, mentioned rock climbing a lot, which uh, <laughs> yeah. there's this uh, new movie, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called Free Solo. No. Oh man, it's amazing. It follows this guy, um, Alex Honnold, and he goes to some of the most dangerous walk, rock walls in the world and he climbs them without a rope. Oh. Yeah, so it's still crazy. It's just one step or one tiny finger hold is the difference between life or death. So it's just the 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 state of mind you'd have to to get in yeah. to do something yeah. like that. Yeah. And so the, in one of the scenes, they um they scan his brain, and they show that he has almost no activation in his yeah. amygdala. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. so like yeah. they're saying, it's not so much that he doesn't feel fear, but it takes a much more um, a much higher stimulus than a yeah. normal person. Yeah. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting point, like whether you can whether he was born with that or whether it was a, a thing that was trained over doing these dangerous things for so many years. It's hard to say. I mean, it's always G by E. Oh, sorry, it's, that's I mean, that's it's always genetic environment interacting. You, like the old the the old nature nurture debates, it's genes. It's the, that's yeah. that's that's very more abundant. Like the two are locked together in this really, really complex interaction. So he probably had, he was probably constitutionally born with some dispositions, but there was also stuff in an early upbringing, mm -hmm. things faced, but he also has probably cultivated this, uh, trying to trace, like you, trying to find the silver bullet point of yeah. it, and it's, no, it just, yeah. it's not really there. Yeah, so, but one thing I think is, is, is very, um, we can have confidence in saying is that extended training and skills is definitely rewiring his brain in powerful and important ways. I mean, that's what practice does. It, it taps into the neuroplasticity of your brain in important ways. Okay, so your book, Zombies in Western Civilization, that was one of the most disturbing books I've ever read. Um, and I mean that in a good way. Like, I feel like you need those those experiences where um, you like have that existential crisis. Right. And do you think, um, you, you'd probably say that in our modern world, we already are alienated, but do you think we kind of need to realize that alienation before we can start to move through it? I think so. I mean, again, the, the mythology is trying to wake us up to the realization. The mythology isn't doing the theoretical work, but it's 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 a it's a it's a psychotechnology designed to wake us up uh, to the realization. One of the the interesting things that many people, other people, there's a lot of people that are converging on this idea, right, of us being in a meaning crisis. Charles Taylor is talking about it with the malaise of modernity, right? Uh, you know, Jung even talked about it way back when when he did Modern Man in Search of a Soul. Right. There's a, there's a lot of different people trying uh, converging on this. But one of the things is often is that the deadening nature of the meaning crisis can often sort of make people superficially unaware of how much it is pervading their life. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they tend to they, they tend to only come into awareness of it when they get, get things that reveal sort of the fragility and the lack of resilience they have to dealing with uh, you know, issues of self-deception, self-destruction, right? A lack of connectedness to other people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not having a worldview that can help them deal with their own suffering and distress, right? All that. I think you're doing some very important work, and I'm, I'm glad you stopped here to talk with us today. Um, oh, it was, it's and what, well, one of your contemporaries is Jordan Peterson at the University of Toronto, right? And so he kind of got famous after getting caught up in that gender pronoun issue. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about just getting embroiled in a personal scandal to get your ideas out there? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in, in, not in the sense that I've considered it, uh, but people have proposed it to me. And um, I, I mean, 
I mean, Jordan and I have debated and we've been at conferences together. I mean, we, we used to talk fairly regularly. Um, and, and so I, 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 I'm, I don't want to easily dismiss or, or, or say anything about, I mean, he's a complex guy and there's lots of, I think he's really, one. I, I think you're right. Part of his fame is his controversy and he, he makes a practice of saying controversial stuff on a regular basis. Yeah. Political controversial, I get that, right? Uh, but I think I think it's fair to say because that doesn't explain all of his success. Yeah, he also puts his finger on the meeting crisis. There's yeah. a reason he and I we we shared so many students and we often appeared at conferences together because we're both concerned in different ways, right, about the the, the meaning crisis. So yeah. I, I, I I acknowledge that. However, and and I I mean I have I I, I would I'd like I'd like to de debate in a good sense, talk with him again in public about responding to the meaning crisis, because there's points of his work that I agree with, there's points of his work that I disagree with, and our last conversation, I think, was really sort of uh, good uh, about that. Yeah. But I don't want to build my audience on the back of controversy, yeah. right? And, 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 and it's not just because that's sort of who I am as a person, but it's also that we talked about this earlier, politicizing these issues Thinking that they're issues of the conflict of political ideologies is something I want to deeply undermine because mm -hmm. that is precisely one of the things driving the meaning crisis. The yeah. idea that we can frame this and resolve it as a clash of political ideologies is exactly something, a presupposition I want to fundamentally excavate and dispose of because that is something significantly contributing to the meaning crisis. So it would I it would feel deeply hypocritical for me to try and build my reputation on the back of a political controversy. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. And um I know with Jordan he he didn't do it on purpose, right? He got kind of got swept up in the controversy. Sure. And that kind of that exposed a lot of people to his ideas that he was already putting out for a long time. That's true. And I think that's yeah. a good point though that um it does seem like a lot of those topics do add to the polarization. So people don't actually listen to you. It's like you say your point, they say their point, and no one's really, no one's really making any ground or listening to each other. That's why I really like, uh, I, I, I like uh, the, the discussion I had with Jordan. I really, really like uh, the discussion that I had with Jonathan um, about that because, you know, Jonathan and I, we differ in some fundamental ways. He's a practicing Christian. I'm not. I mentioned it. But there was so, so much mutual respect and so much, how can we talk about this in like a Socratic and Platonic fashion, I, like I, you know, I, 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 I would be happy to talk with Jonathan again at any point. I think we mutually enjoyed it. We mutually found it beneficial. He, he came to Toronto not that long ago. And we had lunch together. I mean, it's that's 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 what we need to be doing more of. Yeah, those those uh, productive talks instead of just yeah. the the back and forth. Um, yeah. And Jonathan Pajot, I really like his channel because. He comes from a perspective of a practicing Christian, yes, which I don't think I'm ever going to return to something like that, you know? So it's it's from a perspective, but he makes it accessible to everyone. Yes. Christian yes. symbolism that most people wouldn't um, take seriously, he kind of makes it um, makes it relevant to people. Totally. I mean, Jonathan is philosophically astute, and he is very open, right, to considering, you know, arguments and points other than his Christian framework. He sees the value, I think, of other philosophical and religious framework, and I don't think that's false. I think he genuinely sees the value. But what's also important for me, and, and, and you know, I often say this as a slogan, don't tell me what you believe, tell me what you practice. And see, mm -hmm. Jonathan has a practice, and his art, his art, that's not even a good enough word, right? But his art is a sacred practice for him, yeah. and literally a sacred practice for him. Yeah. And so, like he's got a deep and profound practice, and I and I really really respect that. And that 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 means you know even even though we may dif disagree about things, we've got we there's depth there that w we can we can draw upon in conversation, and I find it very valuable to do so. Okay, wow, great. Well, thank you, John, for coming here today. Um, and I feel like this is a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to meet you, Zeke. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And if, I just want to stop now and say, um, you know, thank you uh, for the, the videos. I mean, they're so well done. And, thank and, and you. Thank you. They're, they're simultaneously intellectually rigorous and entertaining. And, you know, and you're doing this in like 15 minutes. 
thing. It's, just, it's just really, really cool. And I know a lot of my students and my viewers, when they see it, they're just, they're really appreciative of it. Oh, and thank I, you, man. I mentioned it to my co-authors. I mentioned it to Chris and Philip, and they're both like, wow, these are great. These are amazing. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. Well, there was so much, there's so much source material to work with. Yeah. Um, you guys did all the legwork, and I, my, I felt like my job was just to try and condense it into something that people could watch in one sitting, you know, yeah. and trying to keep as true to the source material as I could. So I'm glad. I'm, that makes me very glad that, that you enjoyed it. You're, you're succeeding admirably at that. You're just succeeding admirably. So Thank you. Thank you. Um, so where can people find you? Uh, so the, 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 the best thing is, um, I mean, if they want it, they can just email me. Um, if they want to engage in an email conversation, Don, Don Dr. at gmail.com. Or they can just, I mean, if they want to see all this stuff, just go onto my YouTube channel, right? I got a YouTube yeah. channel and just go John, on. John Verveke, right? That has all the, all your lectures and, and all, talks in there. All of it. It's, it's all playlisted. That's where the new video series is being released. It's all there, ready to go. Okay. Anything else you want to promote or talk about? Um, there's more books coming out. There's two books going to be coming out this year. Chris and I are working, working on the follow-up book to the zombie book. Um, it's called um, Unsheltered. It's about the, the whole genealogy of where we lose the sacred canopy in the West and what does that mean for us. And then something like some of what we were talking about today. And then there's uh, a, a book I'm working on with, um, with uh, Daniel Craig and Hannah Torrey and Madeline Eben. And it's called The Cognitive Continuum from Insight to Enlightenment. Uh, all about all that, what I was, how there's, there's these insight experiences, flow experiences, psychedelic experiences, awakening experiences, enlightenment experience, and trying to bring cognitive science to that and make sense of it in, in a coherent fashion. So those are both coming out this year. Okay, awesome, man. I look forward to all of that. Okay. All Thank right. You Thank you, John. Thank you. Take care. All right. You too. Bye.